Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today it's my great pleasure to welcome a woman who's been thrilling audiences with her incredibly powerful and beautiful voice since she burst into our living rooms on The Ed Sullivan Show in 1969. Since then, her multifaceted career has included sold out performances on Broadway, in concert halls, all over the world, and on TV. Her four wonderful albums are in constant rotation in our house, and she has recently released two new singles, which are terrific, not only because of her fabulous voice, but because they also contain important messages of hope and unity that the world so desperately needs right now. I am beyond thrilled and excited to welcome Rosalind Kind to our show. Rosalind, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure, Harvey. Thank you for inviting me. Rosalind, I've been a huge fan of yours since February the 9th, 1969. I remember that date because I was practicing for my bar mitzvah, but my parents allowed me to take a break to watch the Ed Sullivan show. And you absolutely mesmerized the whole world that night. I will never forget it. Oh my God, you know why I remember it? There was a blizzard, the main blizzard, and everybody was stuck at home to watch my interview if they weren't stuck on the trains. <laughs> I understand there was a struggle between the Hollywood Palace and the Ed Sullivan show about which show would get your TV debut. Now, not many stars can say that two top rated shows were fighting over them. Oh my God. Yeah, I didn't know how to handle that. Like, it was unbelievable. But we had got Ed Sullivan wanted me. And then we heard that my agent had made an agreement with the Hollywood Palace. So we, we had to actually go into arbitration. I was so just out of high school. What is up? <laughs> It was so funny. It was weird. But. I have to confess to you that I'm one of the few people out there who refer to Barbara Streisand as Rosalind Kine's sister. And that's oh. because I was a fan of yours before I ever heard of her. Are you kidding me? How could that be, Harvey? I was a late bloomer. You went into the music business at a very young age when you were barely out of high school. In fact, you recorded your first album on the afternoon of your high school graduation. Although some people thought of you as a kind of a child prodigy, to me, you had the voice of a child woman, if that makes any sense. You know something? It does, and I'll tell you why. Because the gentleman, the top-notch photographer, who used to shoot um, all the high people out there in the 60s, he did Princess Grace, he did all these things. He did a session with me because RCA Records wasn't happy with the first session. And so he listened to my album and he said he photographed me like a child woman. He felt I was a sensuous child woman. So it's funny that you should say that. Yeah, that's how I saw you. Now you inherited your voice from your mother who inherited her voice from her father who was a cantor. And then she passed that musical gift down to you and Barbara. Was there a lot of singing in your house when you were growing up? Well, we all loved music. You know, I don't think there was um, constant singing going on, but we all loved music. And I was, you know, I was a toddler, so I was listening to the things on television and stuff in my Hebrew school that I would sing. You remember, zoom, golly, 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 zoom, golly, golly. <laughs> And, and then in for public school, it was, I've got sixpence, jolly, jolly sixpence. I've got sixpence to last me all my life. You know, it's like, things like that. My sister was listening already to when I came on the scene. She was like eight. So what? by the time I had any age to be listening to that, she was already listening to the classics and the, the Lena Horns and everybody and the Mathis. And uh, so she, you know, what I heard her listening to also influenced me as well, even though I was a Beatle maniac. Growing up, I was a child of that English invasion. But um, we, yeah, we, we loved to, we loved music. I mean, we loved, you know, what can you do? You're just, it was different variations. My mother loved Nelson Eddy. <laughs> that was her era. Well, when did you first realize that you had a special gift that you could really sing well? I sang all my life. I, I mean, I, I was a loner mostly as a child. I had a few friends. I could count them on my hands, you know, from school or whatever. But I spent a lot of time alone. And I would create imaginary characters and things. And I would sing with my favorite recordings in the mirror. Or I would look outside at, at, at what was out in front of me, whether it was a forest or whatever. And I would go into that, into that space and sing. You know, but from albums, like I love Shirley Bassey. I love, you know, there was some English, uh, Scylla Black and all these people that I love. 
I just would go out into that into that space. Oh, when I was a, a kid in school, I knew I, I knew I sang well because I people liked my voice, and I was always in glee club and chorus. And but in ninth grade, I had a solo. Was well, no, that was eighth grade. PS eighty nine in Brooklyn, and that was the first time I really, really felt I had something. But to believe in it totally, I was in high high school. And you were a really shy kid. How did you overcome that and end up in show business? It wasn't easy. I used to hide, as a matter of fact, from people, meeting new people. I used to go into, if they were coming to the house, I'd go in the bathroom. Because I was an overweight kid, I didn't really have a great self view, you know? I felt lacking in those ways. But um, I, I once went to work for um, an office out here that was a show business office. And just being on with people in an office dealing situation. I was a purchasing agent and a secretary in the front, you know, answering the phones. And I was dealing with people on that level. And then I don't know that every, every step in my future made it better. I was doing demonstration records for my sister's publishing firm when I was, before I graduated high school. So I got my chops a little bit in the studio at that time. And one of the songs I recorded, she did record. You know, I, what a demo is, is, but you know what a demo is, right? We, you have a, a singer do a song that's signed to your publishing firm. They go in and record it and they send it to other singers to see if they would like to do it. Boy, I'd like to get my hands on some of those demos now. <laughs> now, your sister's known for having struggled with almost paralyzing stage fright. Did you suffer from the same thing? I was, I was nervous. I, you know, I, I don't know that it was paralyzing because my adrenaline would start to go to work for me, but I don't think there's anybody really that goes up so brave and so full of themselves, unless they have a problem in that area <laughs> that, you know, that you're so confident that you're so wonderful. I mean, I think your adrenaline helps you get over that, but I, I was, I, yeah, I, I was nervous. And sometimes before I go on stage, I start yawning and somebody said to me, that's a way of getting over nerves, anxiety. You start to yawn. I should you remember know? that. And then also when I would hear an overture, if I was in a show and I had an overture, even if it was my own, it would get me going, you know? But you're nervous till you hit those first notes and, and you see the audience because the anticipation is a little bit nerve wracking. <laughs> I can imagine. Rosalind, very early on, you got a recording contract with RCA. I never got the impression that RCA did right by you. Are you happier being an independent artist now? Um, I am happy now because I get to choose my material. Yeah, you become a pro when you're with a label, you become their product. And I, and then while I was in, the gentleman who signed me to the label, Harry Jenkins, got fired or whatever. And uh, another guy came in, took his place, and he wasn't going to promote me because the politics. We're going to go back to politics now because it's in everything, Harvey. <laughs> it's in show business. It's everywhere. And that next guy wasn't going to push my, my music. So That's really disappointing. And, and Rosalind, you know, um, please forgive me, but I just have to say this, just in case some people out there are thinking, oh, well, she's Barbara Streisand's sister. She's had everything handed to her on a silver platter. She never had to work for the success she's had. I want people to know that it is so not true. I followed your career from day one. Your sister was focusing on her career, not yours. And oh, yeah. you've worked hard for all of your success. There, I said it. I'm glad I did <laughs> because you're too modest to say it, but I did. Uh, thank you. No, I mean, my, you know, my sister is, she's a legend. She's an icon. I, I'm not my sister. I'm Rozzy. And I love what I do. I want to make people happy in their hearts. That's well, what Roslyn, I do. My favorite album is Come What May. I can't get enough of it, especially the romance medley. How uh -huh. do you go about selecting the songs for your albums? Well, you, you do it with um, your rep, your reps, your producer and everything else. But some of the, you know, those things were in my, were in my show. And um, you put a show together, hopefully showing a little bit so the people get to know who you are, what your persona is. You know, it's not just a grandiose image. And as I've moved along in my career, I've even become more open with my audience. They know more of who I am. I'm very... Um, you know, some people have said to me when we're there in my audience, they said, oh, my God, I felt like I was just in your living room. I just feel this, just this love that permeates the room. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm here to do. In my youth, I didn't know that. I didn't get to that space for a while. 
you know, and you have the people that are around you telling you what you should sing, how you should present yourself. You're too heavy. You got to lose weight. We're not putting your album out until you lose 10 pounds. I mean, all of these things are held over your head. Can I tell you what my favorite song of yours is? Sure. It's from your This Is Rosalind Kind album, and it's called Yes, It Hurts. And it's the English translation of a French song by Mireille Mathieu called mm. Oui, Je Crois. And I absolutely love your version of it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's, just, it's so funny. I've been cleaning out my house these days and I've been coming across my older recordings and I was playing that recently. Really? I was playing that album recently. Yeah. I really hope you will bring that song back to your concert repertoire because it showcases your voice as a belter so uh -huh. beautifully. Maybe I should do it in French. Oh, yes. Now, in 2012 and 2013, you and your sister and your nephew, Jason Gould, went on tour in North America, Europe, and Israel. I saw you in Toronto. I absolutely loved the show. Thank you. I know that everybody had been wanting for a long time to see you and Barbara perform together, but I have to say that I think it was smart of you to wait until you really solidified your own identity as a singer and a performer before appearing on stage with Barbara. That's exactly how I felt. And I've had people say to me, oh my God, you should be doing a show of her material. I said, no, that's my sister. That's not me. Let other people do that. I, I have to be me. I mean, I once did, uh, I don't know if you have saw that in my show years ago, but I did a song called, uh, it was like, I started singing people. And then I went into, I gotta be me. And it was funny, I gotta be her, me? I gotta be me. It was a comment and my friend, my friend at the time, Bud Court from uh, Harold and Maud fame, came up with that idea. And I said, how the heck am I gonna do this? They're gonna hate me. I mean, all the, the anticipation, and I didn't know how people were gonna react. Well, they went first, it was like, <gasps> and then they laughed, and then they applauded. But it was at first a gasp. Oh my God, how could she be doing that? <laughs> that was actually brilliant. It was a great thing to do, and it was funny. Yeah. Exactly. And it really, you know, I am me and I can't help well, who I'm related to and who my family is. Thank God I'm proud of my family. Thank God, I thank God for those things that they're good people, all of them, every one of them. And I, I, I couldn't be happier to be a part of this family. And I'm proud as could be of my sister. I'm proud of my brother in his area. I just love my siblings. I love my great niece and nephew. I love my niece and nephew. I <laughs> like my, my four-legged nephew. <laughs> it's marvelous. Like I say, I'm just, uh, I'm happy to be me. And I'm just happy that I have the chance to now, under my own control, my own auspices, put out my own material, presenting how I feel and how I want to help heal the world. And I'm only a little voice because I'm not my sister. I'm a little voice. But whatever I can do to get out there to promote love and kindness and togetherness and the fact that we're all similar, we're all alike, we have the same blood, stop with the covers, stop, you know? Well, we're going to get into that because that's a very yeah. important part of who you are that really resonates with me. But first, I want to ask you about some of the people you've worked with. You've worked with Bob Hope, Danny Thomas, Mel Torme, my favorite French singer, Charles Aznavour, oh. Dusty Springfield, just to name a few. Any special memories you can share with us? Oh, my goodness. Uh, I, when I was with Aznavour, we were doing a special in uh, it was my first time out of the country. It was in the south of France. It was a special called For Me Formidable. <clears throat> it was produced by a German company. And we were all staying in Cannes and we shot on the Mediterranean, in Provence, and the Giacometti sculptures on a mountain hill, a hill, like a, a rock formation that I had to climb up with my open sandals. Osnivore came up in his big Rolls Royce and he's sitting there talking to the guys down there. And I'm up there, can you please let me get on with this? Because my feet are getting cut by the, by the, the pointed rocks on the hill that I just had to climb. <laughs> and I, I think I did the shape of things to come on there or something. I think I did that song. <laughs> but I was dying because he's down there kibitzing. <laughs> and I'm up there <laughs> That's a memory you would retain, I think. Exactly, you know. Rosalind, you must be aware by now that you and your sister are absolutely beloved by the gay community, and you've done charity work for Broadway Cares, Equity Fights, AIDS, and other causes, and you've always made us feel special among your fans, and I just want to thank you for that. 
My pleasure, honey. I have so many gay friends in my life. I, I go by the heart. I judge by the heart. If you have a good heart, no matter what, how, whatever makes you happy, makes you happy. My family, I have gay members in my family. I love them dearly. And they're no different. They're no different and no less loved. You know, it, it's part of being happy with who you are and getting on in this world, in this life, and, and the accomplishments that you make that are positive, that are good, good for you, good for your family, good for the world, encompass everybody. So let's talk about your new singles, Save the Country and Light of Love. Both songs convey a message of peace, love, and harmony. You co-wrote Light of Love, which is amazing, and you resurrected Laura Nairo's song, Save the Country, but put a totally original spin on it. I just love both songs. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I went into the studio with my record producer, Stefan Oberhoff, who is amazing. He is, he just is so talented and has such great taste that together, you know, I told him for the light of love, what I wanted, how I heard things and everything. And his artistry was is phenomenal. I can't, I'm in the studio again with him. We haven't been in during the whole uh, COVID thing. And we did, we were able during that time via uh, Zoom to do the video for Light of Love. So we did it not even together in a room, but we did it over Zoom. Any, everybody that works with him feels the same way. He is just, a, he's a genius at what he does. He's a magician. And um, I love being in the studio with him. He has helped me stretch. Well, I can see that at this stage of your career, you're taking more chances vocally and with your arrangements, you are stretching. And I think that's so cool. You keep reinventing yourself and you stay current and you stay relevant. I try, I don't look at myself as that way because I have people say to me, you gotta stretch, you gotta try this, you gotta find this. And I, so I don't have an idea that, that I'm actually reinventing myself. I look at others and I'm saying, how do you reinvent yourself? <laughs> I'm so unaware. You've been doing it for years. <laughs> oh, God. Now, so these two new songs reflect a very different Rosalind kind than we knew in the early years. You're using music in your activism. You're making powerful statements that no one should be left out, that we're all equal children of the universe, that we need to strive towards living harmoniously. When did the activist side of you begin to emerge? Well, I, I was, I'm a spiritual person, number one. Let me start there. And in my 1984, I was regressed and found out at that time in my regression that I was here to be a healer. It takes time, though, to get from that point in dealing with what that is and where you're going and the things that happen in your life. But I was always spiritual growing up as a child. I always believe in God. I still wear my mug and David. I am open to every religion that is for peace and for love. I'm very accepting. My activism with that spirituality started coming out in 2016 when it was very much needed. I never was involved in politics and never got into it, uh, except when it was, came to my record deals or whatever, but this was a time, it was a must. It was a time, it was a must. I knew that somehow, like many of us knew from New York, that this was gonna be trouble. And we had to put our, we had to open our mouths and get active to counter counter the you know everything that was putting the falsehoods and the lies and and the, the the hate can we talk about hate i mean i don't like to say that word but it's out there you know and misinformation and so even before it got started before we were ramping up there i got that's when i started getting involved and as a matter of fact i had other songs planned to come out and i came into the studio and i said stefan I think we need to do Save the Country first. We have to do it first. I did it years ago in my New Age show, but this time I needed to put it out and make a powerful statement. Whatever that would help do, whatever it does, in my way, I have to, you know, I have to contribute to wake up people. This is bad. This is not good. This is not spiritual. This is not coming from your religion. This is not, com it's coming from evil. It's coming from an evil space in this world and we've got to fight it out. We must bring the light back. We should be a world of light and we should all be enlightened beings, enlightened souls. 
And I, for one, am here to help do whatever I can to make that happen. Well, it's so fitting in a karmic kind of a way that you are an ambassador for unity and harmony among people because you grew up in Brooklyn in the Vanderveer Estates, which was such a melting pot of ethnicities. Exactly. And here you are advocating equality and mutual respect and understanding. It's like you've come full circle. Yes, to back to my roots. Well, my, you know, like my roots have always been there. I had to grow up to see how, how I was involved with those roots, how, how those became part of me as I became an adult. But when I listen to you talk about hope and unity, and I sense the spirituality in you, it's very clear to me that you're really connected with understanding your purpose in being on this planet. All through my, my being regressed and all through my studies, I was on the road after my regression and I was reading all books on the new age and things about psychic phenomena and people, and I've had visitations. I had, my father came to me, my mother has come into my bed, I had, you know, connections and I was told also that, you know, I worked with dolphins in Atlantis. All of these things I relate to, just like, you know, certain things, just places you go that you said, there's a reason I've been here and I recognize it from maybe another lifetime. Uh, and I've always been told I was an old soul. And that is what made me aware. The reading, the reading the books, having my regression and the interest that I had for that before all of this stuff happened that I had to find my purpose and, and go after it. That had to be who I was in this world. So when do you think Rosalind Kind came into her own and became a full person who felt totally grounded, centered, confident in who you are? Because you're a very different Rosalind Kind that I saw in the 70s and 80s. I would say probably I grew up a lot you know, I was in my 40s, but I was all still, I was working because I had already had my regression and all that. So through your music, I also happen to believe that you're a healer because there's a light that shines in you and there's a kind of an energy when you sing that has a healing quality. Do you listen to yourself sing? Uh, when I'm performing, I, it just kind of comes from my heart. Even my interview with you, somebody said, all right, you got to prepare. You got to prepare. And I said, I've never prepared for an interview. I just come from my heart. I don't know if you're meditating or doing affirmations or whatever, but Rosalind, keep doing it because you convey a sense of serenity that's so refreshing in a celebrity. I got to tell you. Oh, thank you. I, I, I don't know that nobody else has it. That, you know, I'm sure there are. But I, I've had those responses from people that say, you open me up. I tell you things that I don't tell anybody else because you're so open and you're, you're so giving in that way. And it's about having an ear. It's not just about talking. I'm not a big talker. I mean, you're asking me questions, so I'm answering, but I'm not a big, and you know, people say, why did you ever like, like out there? I said, when I'm on stage, I'm on stage. And that's where I can give my heart to the full, you know, appreciation of whoever wants to hear it. And I, I, I my hope is one day to have a big enough, almost like where Jesus was, you know, speaking to people, just that people come to hear me sing, not because of Razi, but because of the, how it makes them feel. It's all yeah. about that. And when I play your albums, it feels like you're singing just to me. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. I've had that, I've had that said to me too. And somebody said to me, how do you make the difference between a small club and the big arenas? Well, the biggest arena I ever worked was the ones with my sister. There were 20,000 people, whatever. And I have to tell you, I love the big arenas. <laughs> and to me, I've always, one of the lessons I, and I've always told this to people, it's up to you to make that arena, everybody in that arena still feel that you are singing to them and them alone. God willing, you're telling me that it had that effect on you, so I'm so happy. Oh, it absolutely did. I, I'm just wondering what triggered this introspective journey that you've been on. Something must have triggered it. Well, you know, we go through pain in our life. You know, I, I like you're telling me, people think I've been handed everything. No, I haven't. And I had my childhood problem, you know, thing, upsets and loneliness. And like I said, I didn't have a lot of friends and I spent a lot of time alone. And even coming to the world, getting the courage to even talk. I once, I, I once had a manager who told me not to do the dance steps on the floor of the Persian room because I was heavy. Excuse me, I'm a dancer. I had a lot of, you know, 
I've got hit with negatives too. And also negatives because my sister who was, who was who she was. And, and, you know, it's like, I don't know why people are like that. Why there's not, you know, why you have to come down on the next person or whatever, because I love, and there's nobody like my sister, you know, and I'm just being me and, and doing what I'm here to do. I but don't think the world would suffer with more great singers. There's no mm -hmm. maximum. I can't understand why anybody would come down on you. I just don't like when people make assumptions that yeah. your life's been easier because in my opinion, when you're under the shadow of someone like that, ask someone like Lorna Luft what it's like to be the sister of Liza Minnelli. Mm -hmm. no, no one with a brain would dispute that it's actually harder. Oh, it is, and, you know, because it's, and it's different when you're the child of, and that's hard enough. But because of the closeness in age, it's like, you know, I've had so many negatives thrown at me and negatives years ago too, over with my dad and my sister, which I was too much of a baby to, to realize what was, what was going on, but it hurts me that that even happened. And, um, and I, there was nothing, you know, if I was a, a, a person that was grown up enough, I could have hopefully helped it get better, but, um, and people hold it, you know, people sometimes hold that against you. And I, that's not, maybe that's why, you know, I was brought into this world to bring a, a better relationship between people to let them know that love and acceptance and, uh, and listening, listening, not so much talking, listening to others matters. You don't just listen, you empathize. You have an enormous capacity for empathy. It comes through in your music. It comes through in every interview I've watched of yours and I've seen them all. You just have an understanding of what it's like to be an underdog. You just do. Yeah, I guess I, I don't think of it being because I'm an underdog. I just think about that that's the right way to be. That's what God meant for us to be there for each other. No, I don't think you see yourself as an underdog. I think that you resonate and gravitate to people that you feel you can help. It's true. It's funny that you say that because I was always aware, even when I was young, not understanding it, why my attention would go to somebody whose eye I would catch who didn't seem happy. And I would aim my performance or my singing at them. And then one time when I was still in my teens, my late teens, I was in San Francisco at a club and I sang uh, When I Fall in Love. And this young couple came to me after the show and they said, we want to thank you. I said, why? Well, thank you very much. What, for what, what? He said, he proposed after you sang that song. After you sang When I Fall in Love, he proposed. He should have proposed to you. <laughs> you know, no, that's not why I was there. <laughs> You know, Roz, I'd love to see you with your own TV show, maybe a sitcom. I, I know you were on The Nanny and you performed the song you wrote, uh, Light of Love Light of on love. The Nanny. But would you ever want your own TV show? I think you're a natural. Definitely. I love TV. I always lost weight when I was on TV. <laughs> the adrenaline, the adrenaline made me lose weight. I mean, it was just unbelievable. I had such a good time when I guessed it on The Nanny. And then I had, I had an, um, an ABC um, deal years ago for television, I had a talent development deal. And uh, I, even the pilot that I did was called Ghost of a Chance with Shelley Long and Gretchen Weiler, may she rest in peace, Stephen Keats, may he rest in peace, Barry Van Dyke, Archie Hahn. And I was supposed to be a spinoff with Archie Hahn if it, if it went, but the, unfortunately the sitcom didn't, didn't ride. But I would love it. I I, lo I love that's the whole and a whole other part. But something where I can be me, play me in a lot of ways. You know what I mean? I think I, you'd also be a great talk show host. You think? Yes, because I think you connect with people, and you there'd be some music, and you'd have guests that that you're on the same wavelength with. And I just I can I'm telling you I think it's coming. Well, pray for me. Pray. I you know what because I would love it. I, I would love to come to, into more people's living rooms and, uh, and share the love. You know what else? I think you'd be a great judge on The Voice or American Idol or one of those singing shows because you really understand vocal technique. You'd be a great mentor to young singers. Would something like that interest you? Maybe, you know, I don't know. I, most of the people that they use on there are much more uh, 
has had more hit records and are out there more than I, you know, than I've been. Except uh, you actually know how to sing. <laughs> okay, my last question. What, are you going to ask me if I was going to be a judge? Because my father wanted me to be a Supreme Court justice like Bertie Amsterdam in New York. Are we going back years? It, no, I didn't. But is that what he wanted you to do? Yeah. Did he never hear you sing? Not really. My father was in the hospital when I was on Ed Sullivan, and he was not in a place where he was coherent enough to oh, hear that. That's, that's really My sad. Father, I was a child also of broken parents. So they left, they separated when I was four. And it was, I was another part of my life where you felt like an adult and you would, you had to be the adult. You know, it's just, um, I look at, I look at, I have friends now that are so happily married. They still walk down the street with, you know, holding hands. And that's, that's what I admire. I wish, I wish that for everybody. I wish it still for myself. I think the best is yet to come. You think? Oh, I absolutely God. do. I think that your time has come because you've developed a message that completely meshes with who you finally understand yourself to be in terms of why you're here. And that gives your talent a different complexion, a different texture. It sets you apart. I really think it took a long time, but there's a Rosalind kind that's out there now that everyone's hungry for. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, you know, I, I hope so. Now, you know, it's not, I don't think of it in terms of my own, but in terms of what God and the universe want from me and uh, whatever I can do to be out there, I would love it. I would love it. Well, you're a very intuitive person. And I think if you keep listening to that voice inside you and keep making the kind of music you've made, especially recently, it's inevitable. It's in the star. You do believe in destiny, don't you? Yes. I do, and I do believe, and I'm also a Capricorn, which means we're late bloomers, and we come into our own late in life. So, you know, I've heard that over and over again. So I'm not, you know, I'm not shutting down or saying my time has passed by no means. You know, sometimes somebody said to me, you know, you're going to Capricorn supposedly get younger with age, their spirit, I guess, gets uh, their spirit, whatever. That's what I, I hear. They get younger because I was always a very serious child too. Well, your journey, if people really listen to your albums, there's a journey that you can hear in the music. In the beginning, there's a sense of control. There's a sense that you're producing the sound that you've been told to produce. And then you develop a confidence. And then there's a soulfulness that comes in. And then there's this message of love, healing, unity, togetherness. That's, it is healing. Yeah, I do. You know, everything I relate to is for healing. So, you know, I, I, everything I undertake is like, well, what does this song say? What are the words saying? What can I give to it that makes it? And I would take something even from a Broadway show and instead of singing it like it's done in the Broadway show, relate it to my life so that I am sharing it in a personal way, not because it was a great song within a theatrical show. Are you anxious to get back on the stage uh, once we can start going to the theater again and nightclubs? Sure, I would love to. I would, you know, and I have. I'm, I'm still putting records out. I'm in the studio now, recording another one, and I have one in the can called um, "Harvest for the World." "Harvest for the World" is waiting to come out, and then I have some love songs, some great medleys, a couple of medleys of love songs, powerful love songs to come out also. I sure hope you will come back on our show every time you have a new project because you're always welcome. Oh, thank you, Harvey. You know, I had it, my favorite cousin was named Harvey. And my favorite singer is named Rosalind Kind. <laughs> I have only one question for you left. Yes. Do you really get, I mean, deep down inside, do you really get how truly gifted you are as a vocalist? I don't know. I leave that to God. I always look at it like that's God coming through me. It's a power, whether you, you know, whether, whoever you believe in. And the universe, I'm a child of the universe. I'm a child of God. And I, I do believe there is a, a destiny, a path. And that's why I can't question it. As children, we question it. Like, why this and why that? But, but I've come through so many trials and tribulations that were all lessons on my way to where I am now. 
Well, I have to tell you, Rosalind, having you on our show has been a dream come true for me. I've loved you from day one. I'm so honored you took the time to visit with me and my viewers. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Harvey. Anytime, anytime. Our guest has been the incomparable Rosalind Kind. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.